I'd like to welcome you to Ponderings from the Preacher. This is Pastor Tim Miller, Bible Baptist Church in New Franklin, Missouri. The desire of my heart for this broadcast is simply to let's talk about Jesus, the Word of God. Let's be uplifting. I'm so thankful you are tuned in today. Well, good morning. Welcome to today's broadcast of Ponderings from a preacher and thank you for tuning in watching this video I hope it'll be a blessing to you this morning I'm excited to introduce a guest that is a personal friend of mine uh, and that is uh, pastor Jeff Harris you pastors in New York at the Anchor Baptist Church in Rochester and I'll let him say a little bit more about himself and I'm excited for you to hear him he's a personal friend uh, for many years so uh, brother Harris welcome to the uh, program this morning and we're excited to have you Thank you so much, Brother Miller. It's an honor to be a part of uh, this program. I really like your name, Ponderings from a Preacher. The very first thing that went across my mind is uh, Ponderosa Steakhouse. So I'm immediately go. on board with this program. <laughs> but listen, I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to share a little bit from uh, the Word of God today and, and from my heart. Um, just briefly, I'm from Kentucky, born and raised. I uh, was privileged to plant a church just outside of Fort Knox, Kentucky, in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, back in uh, 2001. And uh, then in 2013, uh, we planted another church in Rochester, New York. Um, actually, we moved here in 2012 and then started the church in 13. But that being said, I'm born and raised in Kentucky and certainly from that neck of the woods. And I certainly uh, appreciate going back and visiting family and friends or being around anybody who's from that neck of the woods. Uh, Pastor Miller asked me if I would uh, share something in terms of a devotional from my heart, from the Word of God. And so I do have something. I'm actually preparing this right now for my church. Normally, I preach any sermon I write first for my church and then for everybody else. Um, but I thought this would be great. Uh, this might be a help and encouragement to you. So uh, although it's not completed in terms of a sermon format, I think the principle you'll, you'll be able to benefit from. So we know according to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 2, when he talks about, you know, presenting your bodies a sacrifice to the Lord, right? In verse 2, at the end of it, he talks about the perfect will of God, what is uh, that acceptable and perfect will of God. So God has a will for every human being. Um, with that said, he's got this desired outcome for my life, but he's not going to force me to do his will. He can certainly persuade me. He can certainly guide me. And if he wanted to, he could force me, but he doesn't. He's made us a free moral agent so we can choose. So he has this desired outcome for my life. It's up to me to choose to either follow that or not follow it. If I don't follow it, there's some negative consequences to it. If I decide to follow God's will, there's a whole bunch of blessings. The Bible says in Proverbs, it says, The blessings of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow to it. There's no hangover in doing the will of God. There's no regrets in doing the will of God. There's no scars, emotional, mental, physical, in doing God's will. So there's just a couple of things I want to highlight. First of all, um, how do I find God's will? And then how do I follow the will of God for my life? Well, the key word to that is the word submission. According to James chapter number four, the Bible tells me in verses seven through eight, it says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So the very first word in verse seven is submit and it's submission to God. Then, and by the way, that's a choice you and I have to make. Then in verse eight, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So when you decide to submit to God, you're taking that step. You're drawing nigh to the Lord, and then he can draw nigh to you. He will be close to you. 
He will bless you. You'll experience his presence like never before. But again, as I stated earlier, you don't have to do that. It's certainly your prerogative. It's your life. You can do whatever you want to do, but you're the one that's going to miss out. You're the one that's going to suffer. But if you decide, I want to do the will of God, and uh, you've come to that point of submission, well, there's two things here. There is submission to the written will of God, which every Christian is supposed to do, and it's the same for everybody. Then there is submission to the revealed will of God. Now, that revealed will of God is different for every individual Christian. Um, God expects me and you to do the same um, written will of God, follow the same commandments. Once I do that, once you do that, then God has a different revealed will that he will show me of in particular what he wants me to do. For, for example, he called me into the ministry. He called me to plant a church in Elizabethtown, Kentucky in 01, and then again in 2013 in Rochester, New York. So that revealed will is for my life only. But I'm not focusing on that this evening, or this morning rather. I want to focus on the first point, and until you get this one, you'll never get the revealed will of God, and that is submission to the written will of God. Well, what exactly do I mean by that? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, in verse number 3, for this is the love of God, that, um, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. You know, I hear a lot of people say, you know, preacher, I, I, just, I just don't like all the rules. Um, I, I just don't like uh, all these things that I have to do. Let me just simply say this. According to the Bible, the only way you and I get to heaven is by the grace of God Amen. through faith. There's no rules involved, no works, nothing. It's a free gift. You either accept it or reject it. Again, it's a personal choice. However, the book of James says faith without works is dead. You are a dead Christian. You're, you're not faithful to the Lord. You're not alive spiritually. You may be saved, but you've been backslidden on God if there's no works in your life. You've got you to gotta have both in order to honor the Lord with your life. Well, the works portion of our Christian life does not earn our salvation. It does not keep our salvation. It just simply shows how much I love the God who gave me my salvation. Verse 3 again says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Matter of fact, in, in James, it talks about looking into the perfect law of liberty. You would think that law and liberty would be a paradox, a contradiction, but in reality, it's not. There is perfect freedom inside the confines of the laws of God. Case in point, when God told Adam and Eve, he says, look, you can have from any fruit, from any tree you want, the one in the middle, don't touch it. The day you touch it, you're a dead man. That's, I'm paraphrasing. But guess what? They had freedom as long as they stayed within that boundary of not touching and eating from that one tree. When they decided to do their own thing, when they decided not to submit to God, that's okay. They could certainly do that. It's their prerogative. They're, they're a free moral agent. The moment they did that, they realized, uh-oh, I made a mess of myself. Right. So much so that the Bible says that they ran from God. You say, I don't see that in the book of Genesis. Well, it doesn't say they ran from God, but it does say they were hiding. It does say that as the Lord was walking in the cool of the day, he said, where art thou? And and uh, Adam uh, said, we were hiding because we were afraid. And the Lord said, uh, you know, who told you? You know, I mean, I mean, why are you hiding? He said, we're naked. And he said, who told you you're naked? And, and, and he's going back and forth. Well, they got their hand caught in the cookie jar. So therefore, they ran when they were afraid. But it was their prerogative. That, those were the consequences they had to deal with because they did not submit to God. So in reality, had they followed the commandment of God, they would have had freedom. Now they're slaves to sin. Now, I, I don't have a lot of time. I just want to quickly give you a quick rundown and hone in on just one or two verses. When you talk about proving your love for God, Jesus said it best in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So let me give you one example of the written will of God. 
faithfulness to the house of God. Now, why do I say that? It's the coronavirus. Everybody's trying to reopen. Everybody's been staying home, watching TV online. They've been in their pajamas and their slippers and eating chicken wings and drinking Pepsi while watching church on, on, on TV. And it, it gets kind of nice when you're sitting in your recliner and you don't have to, you know, leave the house 30 minutes before church to get to church and be 10 minutes early or anything of that nature. You just come in and look however you look and just grab whatever food and just kind of plop down on the couch and watch church, right? Well, now the church is reopened and people are going back to the house of God. It's imperative that we obey the word of God when it comes to the Lord's house and being faithful to God's house. Um, for example, Jesus Christ, as a young boy, the Bible says every year his parents took him to the, to the temple in Jerusalem uh, to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. Now, technically, according to Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 16, Jewish males went to the temple in Jerusalem three times a year. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is connected to the Passover, the day after Passover. The Feast of Weeks, or what we would call Pentecost. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, which was in the fall. And so, Jesus, having fulfilled the law would have been to the temple in Jerusalem at least three times a year. We know that according to the book of Luke, chapter number four, in verse 16, Jesus visited in Nazareth, his hometown, the synagogue, and he began to read the scriptures on the Sabbath day. He would have visited the, uh, the house of God, the synagogue, if you will, uh, every single week on the Sabbath day. When you go to the New Testament, you've got John the Apostle, who spent three some odd years with Jesus, the beloved John the Apostle, writing the book of Revelation on an island out in the midst of the Aegean Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, that is, um, on the Lord's Day, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Well, what is the Lord's Day? You have the Sabbath day. That's the seventh day, right? That's Saturday. You have the Lord's Day, the Lord Jesus Christ, the day he arose from the dead. That's the first day of the week. The early church met on the first day of the week, on Sunday. There are many reasons why we know that, but they were celebrating the resurrection of Christ. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, they're to take up a collection, verse 1 through 2, on the first day of the week. But here's the interesting thing. Everybody knows it's time to go to church on Sunday morning. What about Sunday night? What about when a lot of people are just saying Sunday night's not that important? In fact, I, you know, I, I watch football. I watch baseball. I, it's family time. We get around the, the couch in the living room, watch TV, enjoy a nice clean uh, movie or America's Funniest Videos. Or in some people's cases, they're working an extra shift. Well, how come Sunday night's not all that important? It used to be regardless of the denomination. Uh, they all had Sunday night church services. And people who were members of a church knew it was not just expected. It was their duty, their obligation to go to Sunday night church services. Now, I've heard all the different theories of how Sunday night services came about. And some say with the advent of electricity and lighting, that's one reason why people came. Uh, others said the uh, industrial revolution and of course um, having to go to work seven days a week and guys couldn't go to church Sunday morning. They had Sunday night services as a kind of an evangelistic meeting to preach the gospel to those who miss church Sunday night or Sunday morning to come Sunday night. And I've heard all those different things, but let me just give you a couple things to quickly consider. And that is this, the Bible says in the gospel of John chapter number 20, after the resurrection of Christ, in John 20 and verse number 19, it says this, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, that's Sunday, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, okay, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them, in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. The Bible says, in the evening, on the first day of the week, 
the disciples were assembled. Now, they were assembled because they were afraid of the Jews, right? But notice the word assemble. You know the word church means they called out assembly from the Greek definition of the word ekklesia? You say, well, preacher, you're kind of stretching it. Well, so here in this verse, Jesus met with his disciples on a Sunday evening. And you can say, well, that's not really a church service like what we know today. Okay, let me give you one other food for thought. Let's go to Acts chapter number 20 and in verse number 7. And here you have the Apostle Paul. The Bible says in verse 7 of chapter 20 of Acts, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Paul the Apostle is referred to as the Apostle to the Gentile, right? And so here he's basically saying to the Gentile uh, believers in church, you know, we, we have church on Sunday night, and matter of fact, I'm going to preach, and I'm going to preach all the way till midnight. Now, I'm not saying that you ought to preach till midnight. I realize most people would not stay or return the very next week. All I'm tr simply trying to say is this. If Sunday is an important day, why not come back on Sunday night? Amen. Are you mean, do you mean to tell me my priority of watching Sunday night football is more important? You mean to tell me that going out to the lake on Sunday night is more important? You, may, you mean to tell me, remember Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And one of the commandments that's found in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling the same word, if you will, mentioned in John 20, verse 19, when Jesus met with his disciples that were assembled for the fear of the Jew Jews on the first day of the week in the evening. So understand, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, like some skip church on Sunday night, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. All that being said, if this devotional gets under your skin and makes you mad, I'm not trying to make you mad, uh, but I want you to think about something. Who do you really love? You mean to tell me you love the NFL more? You mean to tell me you love your lake, your tree stand, your fishing boat? You mean to tell me, well, you say, preacher, I love my family, and that's why we have family time. Uh, last time I checked, you could sit together as a family in the same row and worship the Lord together as a family. That's a novel idea. How about trying that one? In reality, I think what's happened is in America, with the repeal of blue laws and with entertainment now having different forms, radio, TV, internet, ball games are now playing on Sunday. Christians no longer live by conviction based off the Bible. You just follow the culture. Last time I checked, if you follow the culture, it can get you in a lot of trouble, a whole bunch of trouble. So if you follow conviction, you see Jesus. Ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that question. I'll end with this. The book of Psalms says this. David made the statement. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. What are you glad about? I hope it's about going to church on Sunday night. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Harris. I was uh, thinking that same thought as, um, as you finished up there, that I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So thank you for joining us today, and thank you for listening to our listeners. And guess what? I hope to see you Sunday morning and Sunday night at church this week. Amen. Uh, I sure love the Word of God. I love the Lord. He's good to us. God bless you. hope you have a great day. <laughs>